Okay. Um, it is my privilege uh, this morning to introduce um, someone I'd really call a friend of mine. Um, I've known her for several years, but um, Dr. Barbara Ingrid Bratson is professor of exercise science at Wayne State College. Um, she is also vice chair of the Academic Policies Committee, member and past chair of the President's Council of Diversity and member of the Service Learning Advisory Committee. Dr. Ingebrigtsen is a member of the American Physiological Society and, the Nebra and specifically the ne Nebraska chapter. Any Nebraskans out there? Um, she is a past president of the Nebraska Physiolo Physiological Society. She is president of the Wayne Rotary Club and um, coordinated the Rotarian uh, Humanitarian Global Grant in 2014 to fund water wells, sanitation, resource management, peace and conflict resolution in South Sudan. Some of her work at uh, Wayne State has involved facilitating student community activities uh, to, uh, um, she also promotes uh, bicycle culture and in Wayne. And uh, she coordinated the development of a minor in public and global health. Uh, Inge Bratzen was awarded the State uh, National Bank Teaching Excellence Award in 2015 and the Wayne Rotarian of the Year in 2011, 2014, and 2016. She also received the Outstanding Student Presenter at the International uh, Hypoxia Symposium in uh, Banaf, Alberta in 2003. Dr. Ingebrigtsen received the Fulbright uh, Global Scholar Award, uh, um, and uh, she has many other accomplishments. So let's um, give a big World Affairs Seminar welcome to uh, kind of one of our own, Dr. Barbara Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Greg, for such kind words. And um, for everyone here, um, namaste, salam, greetings. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm privileged to be here. Uh, I've, the first time I came to World Affairs Seminar was in 2014. And the last time I was here was in 2017. So it's been a while and it feels like coming home again. And I was wondering, I wonder if Greg will be there. And this morning at breakfast, I walked up to him and I said, Greg, do you remember, you probably don't remember me. And it, just from my voice, he said, Dr. Barbara Ingebretson. So he's an amazing, I can't remember names and faces that well. So anyway, he's an amazing person and a friend. Um, great thanks to Stuart and Michael who have been putting this together. Um, Stuart is a long friend also. And uh, I am just uh, honored to be here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my mic down and stand here for a little bit. But throughout the, the presentation today, I'm not going to let you sit down all the time. I mean, you can sit down right now. But I'm going to have you standing up periodically, talking amongst yourselves and getting to know each other better. And then I'll have a couple of you come up and you know, share some of the thoughts that you talked about with your little groups um, as we go through this presentation. So we'll get started. So, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. So, uh, when I looked at the lineup of speakers, um, I was a little, maybe a lot, intimidated uh, because Dr. Jonathan Patz has a Nobel Peace Prize. And, uh, and Dr. Joya Mukherjee, who you're going to hear later, and I've heard her speak, and I'm so glad I'm not following her because she is so contagious and enthusiastic that she's going to tear you guys out of your seats. Um, but she has she worked closely for two decades with um, a person who has been kind of my lead and guide in his philosophy and his work. I've attended se uh, seminars, and that's Dr. Paul Farmer. So he's pictured here on the side here with Dr. Joya. And uh, Paul Farmer sadly died um, just of a sudden cardiac event. He it came in the family um, this past February. So, uh, but his legacy is part of the work that I've had. 
Um, and when I was thinking about these two people and all the other speakers you're going to be hearing, I thought to myself, oh, wow. Well, I ride bikes. I can do that. Uh, so we'll just see. Um, but now I want you to stand up. And you may be sitting with people that you've been getting to know. But I want you to think about these, th these things. I was able to attend uh, Dr. Potts's um, uh, virtual presentation on climate and health. So specifically, um, I'm going to ask you to talk with each other about where you're from and what brought you to WAS. What was the biggest takeaway point that you got from Dr. Patz's presentation? What was the most disturbing and what was the most inspiring and hopeful? Now, after you had a couple of minutes to talk, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. I'm gonna keep the I'm gonna keep the tech people online. Okay, so I'm gonna let you talk for about two or three minutes, and then I'm gonna just ask. Two from this side, two from this side, and if we've got any virtuals, do we have any virtuals? Can I tell? Can I tell participants? Yeah, we, oh, we've got 12 participants. Okay, good. So um, I'll have you, you know, come up and just share at the mic, and then we'll move on. So just think about these questions, share with yourselves. Virtuals, you can do it in the chat box, and then when um, we get to you, I'll just have you unmute yourself so you can share what you guys talked about. So, okay, those four things, take five. Two or three. All right. Wow. The energy in the room is contagious. 
Now I'm just going to ask for two people from this side to come to the mic and just share, you know, what you guys talked about and two from this side come to the mic and talk about what you shared about. Don't be shy. Any two? Yes. Yes, go. How about this side? Do we have two from this side to come up? Go for it. Okay, so you guys can talk to that. Uh, hello, I'm Max Southwell from a small town called Glen Ellen in Illinois. Thank you. Um, what brought me to World Affairs Seminar was just, um, I, I suppose, the uh, a lucky picking. I uh, by my school. I, I just I, I felt I feel very uh, um, what what's the word happy to be here. I, I should say, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, the most important thing that I, at least my group talked about that we took away from Dr. Patz's uh, presentation was that the crisis is here now and it's way more detrimental than any of us could have ever imagined. Um, at least I remember a time when it was coming and um, it just the fact that we are in the midst of it is so much more horrifying than at least I could imagine. And that's a part of the most disturbing thing that we took away from it was uh, the fact that we need to do something immediately to stifle this sort of stymied within the world. Um, what inspired hope, at least for two of us, was the amount of initiative programs that are in place. So we talked about the use of solar panels and um, just recyclable energy uh, sources. And I think that was very inspiring to hear from Dr. Patz. Hi, I am Peyton. We are both from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And um, what brought us to the seminar was just. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, extensive research. <laughs> extensive research. We looked at a lot of other like opportunities like this, and this one really stood out to us and was transportation wise, just would really would work for us. And I'm really glad we're here. Yeah. It was a great decision. Just, yeah, we'll, we'll um, right and about like the presentation, I feel like. What we, we both agreed on what was the most disturbing part is the fact that it's made a political issue. But really, it's like, it's a world issue. It's it's a world issue. It affects all of us, no matter what your political stance is. Um, and I respect everyone's beliefs, everyone's political standing. And I feel like that's why we need to stand together as a community, as a whole, because it affects all of us. Yeah, and, um, ooh, that's scary. <laughs> um, and especially when considering the fact that a lot of people in office right now, they are older because that is something where you get more responsibility as you get older, you get more experience. However, the people who are leading a lot of countries right now won't have to see the day where our oceans will be too acidic to swim in, our, our food will start dying, the ecosystems will start falling apart. So a lot of times it gets covered up because they don't care because they won't be here, but we all will. And so it's something that the younger generation has to really think about because no one else will. Thank you so much. Hi, my, hi. Okay. <laughs> hi, my name's Annika. I'm here at the World Affairs Seminar because I wanted to communicate with more like-minded people who want to create change in the future. Um, the most important thing our group talked about that we took away from Dr. Pats was mainly that our, like, I had it written down here, but that it's not so much like an ecosystem problem, it's more of a human problem, and that if we don't solve it, we're going to face the effects, not just in our environment. So to live a healthier lifestyle, we need to um, combat these problems. Um, and that's kind of also the most disturbing thing we took away is because we created the problem, so we have to solve the problem. But that also comes from one of the most inspiring things we saw, which is how much people in this room do want to change the way things are done and also go into politics when they're older or different professions to change the way things are done. All right. Okay. I'm going to see. So on Zoom, let's see, do we have, I don't know if I can see share the screen here or do we have any participants that would like to uh, speak and you can unmute yourself and just speak just introduce your name
Okay, going, going, gone. Let's see, I, I'm gonna look at the chat and see what they said in the chat. I cannot hear anything, can any of you? Okay, they can't hear anything in Zoom, so. <laughs> I can, okay, McKinney can. <laughs> All right, well, thank goodness for technology. <laughs> All right, so what I'll do is I'll just continue to, uh, I'll go on to the next slide. Wrong way. Oh, wait. There we go. All right. This is the one I wanted to have on. So um, you all have some stories, and I hope that throughout this uh, week you're going to learn each other's stories and the importance of listening to people's stories. And I don't want to tell you a whole lot about my whole life because I'm very old, and there would be a lot of things I'd have to tell you. But I am going to tell you about three things that are important connections that happened to me. So first of all, I'm a physiologist. I grew up in Southern California. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a lawyer. My husband is a pastor. So things that are really important, maybe even in my genetics, is learning and teaching. That's always been a part of me. And my dad, being a lawyer, um, it's all about justice and equity. When things are not equal or equitable, it disturbs me a lot, and I'm not okay with that. Um, and then finally, I have faith and hope that um, we have the capacity to do some things about it. So in about 2010, I was as a physiologist, I kept thinking, you know, we know all of the physiology of uh, diseases like heart disease, diabetes, et cetera, but we're not making a big difference. In fact, the obesity epidemic was escalating exponentially, similar to our climate change about that time. And I'm going to show some slides on that in a minute. And it disturbed me. And as a physiologist, I'm going to talk about a little bit about physiology. You, homeostasis is kind of your key word. That means that um, we need to have a stable temperature, water balance, energy balance, all of those things. And when those are disturbed, then our physiology has to adapt and cope and adjust in order to keep us alive. And if it doesn't, then we die. Okay. So my academic homeostasis was disturbed by the fact that my discipline, physiology, which knew all of the, the reasons for why we're you know, not healthy was not doing anything to make us healthier. So that's when I started to morph into understanding um, about you know, public and global health and social determinants of health, as well as biological and medical determinants of health. Meanwhile, my kids were growing up. I have three kids. My youngest daughter um, was about a sophomore in high school, and all of the great teachers that my sons had had um, were retiring and resigning, and she was done. And so we started looking at the possibility of an exchange program for her for her senior year. And that was when I discovered Rotary International, which has a Rotary Youth Exchange Program. Does anybody in here um, know anything about that? Have you done it or you had exchange students? Yeah. So yeah, you've had it too? Awesome, awesome. It's an awesome program. So anyway, I learned about this exchange program, and she did a, a year in Germany, but I learned about Rotary, which is a service organization, and I met kindred spirits, people that wanted to change the world and use the resources that they'd been given and the privileges that they had to make a difference in the world. So some of these pictures here, uh, it's showing uh, Tracy Kidder wrote the book about um, Paul Farmer, Mountains Beyond Mountains. If you haven't read it, that's a game changer, a life changer. It has been for me. I require it in my public and global health classes. Uh, my daughter, this is a picture in front of Beethoven's house in Germany. That was kind of fun. Um, and that led to learning about a global grant program through Rotary. Naively, I just said, I met this young man, Bui Tut. So he's the, uh, up at the top there. Uh, he's from South Sudan. His family came here as uh, refugees from South Sudan. And he was finishing college when uh, South Sudan and North Sudan, or Sudan, um, came to an agreement that South Sudan would be its own country. And he and some of his friends who were also South Sudanese um, refugees wanted to give back from the opportunities they'd be been given when they came to the United States. It was powerful. And I thought Rotary is all about serving others and um, water and sanitation was one of their key areas of em emphasis. So I tried to introduce him to people I knew from Rotary in Omaha and they said, why don't you write a global grant? And I was brand new at this, but Long story short, it ended up, we ended up getting about $120,000 um, 
to fund and, and provide water for about 10,000 people in South Sudan. Um, so it opened the doors there. Not only that, but Bowie is more than just a friend. He's family to me. He's now married. He has a son and uh, he's family to me. So he opened the door for me to go to Ethiopia. So as a professor at Wayne State College, uh, we had some, this is in Nebraska, not the Wayne State University in that other place, Michigan, I think, um, at Wayne State College, Nebraska. Um, we had a lot of student exchange programs, but none of them were going to the continent of Africa. And I said, you know, Americans are really not very knowledgeable about Africa, or many places actually, but Africa in particular, they think it's a country. And so I had a very good friend from Kenya, uh, and she and I started planning to go to a country in Africa, we hadn't decided yet, to see if we could set up some exchange programs for our students from Wayne State College. And because Bowie's mother is from Ethiopia, he had connections in Ethiopia. So he opened the door for us to go to Ethiopia. So I'm on sabbatical um, for the spring of 2015. All of that's arranged. Then I discovered World Affairs Seminar. Um, late in the spring of 2014, I saw the, the, um, the information about World Affairs Seminar, and it was on global health. And it was too late for us to get a delegate from Nebraska to come, but um, the topics were so fascinating and the speakers were world-class and I wanted to come and listen to them. So I contacted Tom Plantenberg at the time and said, can I come to this? And he says, sure, what do, why do you wanna come? And I explained and he goes, well, then you'd have to do a presentation too. So I had to do a breakout presentation at that time, but it was definitely worth it. In that time then, uh, there were a group of Nepal students. So they're down here at the bottom. That's, in, that's at Carroll University. So on the far left, um, it, well, on the, the middle one with the blue shirt, that's Roshan. And then there's Rak Rakesh is on the other side of the, the whiteboard. He, he uh, actually just finished his bachelor's a couple years ago from Wayne State College. And uh, Suman, their teacher, but I thought I had another picture with uh, Dippin. He's, he was, he's been a counselor for, um, for World Affairs Seminar. Um, anyway. Because I'm an altitude physiology, that physiologist, that's what hypoxia is all about. I thought to myself, hmm, maybe I can go to Nepal after we're done in Ethiopia because I have the whole semester off and I'll get to see the, the Himalayas. So I looked at it and that's what we were gonna do. And I talked to my, the World Affairs Seminars delegates and said, will you be around if we come? And the teacher, and they said, what are you doing in Ethiopia? And I told them and he said, well, then you have to do it here too. So he set up for me to be able to meet people in Nepal um, and see if we could do exchange programs there. Long story short, in both countries, in Bahadar, Ethiopia, and in, in Nepal, we met, I met um, uh, colleagues that were kindred spirits who were interested in establishing a mutually beneficial exchange. So a lot of times, Americans go for a couple minutes and a couple days, and they do some good stuff there, and then they leave, and they create almost a dependency on their, on their being there or their hosts are overburdened by welcoming us and taking care of us while we're there. And I said, if you see a reason that us coming to you will benefit what you're doing, then that's mutually beneficial and I'm interested. And the second thing was, it has to outlive us, be institutionally sustainable. So when we were looking for partners, I found those kindred spirits in Bahadar, Ethiopia, at the university there, and at the Children's Hospital in Nepal, um, which is a tertiary care hospital for eyes, ears, nose, throat, and we'll talk about that later. Um, horrible dilemma. How am I gonna choose between those two? Well, my friend Leah, who's, who went with me, she's the one from Kenya, she discovered that the Fulbright organization had just started a new scholar program that was ideal. You had to go to at least two countries in preferably two regions of the world, got that, we got Asia, we got um, Africa, um, and it was flexible. So it would fund me for up to six months over the course of two years. So I'd already used up my sabbatical. This allowed me to go back and go back in the summertime. And I would spend about eight weeks, or eight to 10 weeks in Nepal first before the monsoons. And then I'd go straight from there to Ethiopia. And then I'd come back for the next year to start. Um, so that was the Fulbright. And, and that's what I'm gonna share with you today. A couple of things about what we did during that time. The reason I want to tell you that though, as a keynote speaker and knowing the type of students that come to the World Affairs Seminar is, is I do see you as the change makers with so much potential. I want you to always keep your eyes open 
for the connections that you can make and the doors that those will open for you to do things you would have never imagined. So uh, let's keep going here. So just remember, stories and journeys and contagious ideas are very important. And uh, just have a dream, keep your eyes on the summit, but learn to enjoy the journey. So the imperative of multiple perspectives. I don't know if you've ever heard this metaphor where the elephant is, uh, there's seven or eight blind people that are trying to figure out what they're feeling here. And one of them is feeling the trunk and says, I think it's a snake. And another one's feeling a leg. I think it's a tree and so on and so on. Um, but they don't, they're only seeing a part of the elephant. You have to be able to work together to say, well, you're seeing a, a, a snake and this, maybe it's all together. We should look at it together. Um, so understanding health has been, and academics in general, has been siloed. You know, we become so specialized when we get a PhD that we hang out with only people that think like us. As a physiologist, I do my physiology research and I go to the lab and I talk to people that talk about stuff that I want to talk about in physiology. But physiology is in itself can't be siloed. We have to be able to zoom into the details, the molecular, the genetic, the, you know, we have to look at all of those, but then go back out to the big picture and say, well, what does that mean to the cardiovascular system? And what does the, the neurological system or the endocrine system have to do with the cardiovascular or pulmonary system? So physiology in itself has to be able to be multiple perspectives, but even that was siloed, as I told you before, when we were just staying in and thinking that physiology could answer all the questions and make us healthier. So we, we have to remember that our physiology lives in a social and environmental context. All of us have different contexts that affect our physiology. And if we don't understand those contexts and work with people who do understand those contexts, we're never going to be able to solve the problems. So I told you I, I was a little bit disturbed by the fact that the obesity epidemic was accelerating, even as we were preparing people to know all of this stuff. So um, just a background on physiology. How many of you guys have had an anatomy and physiology class? Okay. Okay. Raise your hand if you know what homeostasis is. Yes. Okay. Because I told you. Okay, good. So homeostasis has been the foundation of physiology since about the, you know, the early 1900s. And um, it just wasn't really solving everything. So about 10, 15 years ago, a couple other scholars started saying, you know, there's more to it. Sometimes our physiology has to adjust and, um, and we're in a different context and it's going to respond differently to the same uh, disturbances than it would in a different context. And I know this is a lot to think about right now, but um, just simple homeostasis can't explain why our bodies do things sometimes one way and other times another way. So they started asking, could other stressors, those could be things like societal. So I'm going to read this right here because it's in small print. Superimposed on this predictable life cycle are unpredictable events, including many potential stressors requiring immediate physiological um, and behavioral adjustments to, to cope. And additionally, infections, disease, age, old injuries, social status, discrimination isn't in there, but that's a, that's a huge thing, um, influence how an individual goes about its life cycle routines and responds to unpredictable per perturbations. So how many of you have ever noticed that at the end of the semester when you're all stressed out, that's when you get sick? Yep. <laughs> it's not like you weren't exposed to those pathogens at other times, but at that time, you don't have the same physiological capacity to respond to them. And that's just one example. Um, it, there's a lot more that will that um, is very interesting to a physiologist, but we don't have time for it now. So the non-communicable diseases mean they're non-infectious, so we don't catch them from a virus. Now, I say that tongue-in-cheek in a way, because in a way, some of the behaviors that may lead to these non-communicable diseases are contagious. Like if all our friends like to eat certain foods or drink certain things, we do it together. And so, you know, we shouldn't say that they're not totally non-contagious, but uh, this is in the uh, 
context of a pathogen. So an infection like a bacteria or a virus or something like that. So they include the heart diseases, but the ischemic heart diseases are the ones that cause coronary artery disease, and that's the most common. Um, but stroke also is a, is a vascular disease also, uh, but that affects the brain, diabetes, cancers, and chronic respiratory um, diseases. Those are the non-communicable diseases. And these are also, have been traditionally called lifestyle diseases because they're not caused by a pathogen, it's thought that they're just caused by some lifestyles, like eating too much, not doing enough activity, maybe too much tobacco, or other lifestyle choices that a person makes. Globally, these account for more than 70% of all deaths every year. And 70 to 75% of these diseases are preventable by these healthy lifestyles. Okay, simple. We've been knowing this for years, and we've been telling you. You've probably heard this. You better exercise and eat right, right? So now I'm going to give you a chance to stand up and, and talk with yourselves now. And I just want to true and false and think why you're choosing this. So um, on my right and online, you guys can put it in the chat box online if you can hear me, I hope. And, um, and then we'll come up here, uh, just have a couple of you come up here. But so on this side right here, you guys are going to say non-communicable diseases are diseases of affluence. I have too much money, too little to do, that type of thing. True or false and why you think that? Over here, I want you to think non-communicable diseases are a greater burden in low-income communities and countries. True or false, and why? Okay, so stand up and take five. All right. <laughs> Wow. Okay, I'm going to just ask one or two people from each side to come up and share what you think. So somebody from this side, anybody want to volunteer to come up? Okay, all right, from this side, I'll just have you guys raise your hands then. 
And maybe I'll just come and ask a question. Um, raise your hand if you think it's true, if they're diseases of affluence. Okay, and then some of you thought it was false. So the true, why did you think it was, and I'll repeat your answer so just I can hear you. So true, why did you think it was a, a diseases of affluence? Anybody? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you guys, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm backwards, sorry. So, okay, so you guys are the, um, you thought it's true that it's a greater burden in lower income countries. Okay, so why? Yes. Um, people that are in lower income communities and countries are more likely to fall into substance abuse and to have higher diseases and they don't have the money to like get treated or and are just like in more behavioral risks of like falling into these things. Okay, so maybe, yeah, so if you didn't hear, she said they're, they're more likely to have other issues, fall into substance abuse, not have the money to get treated. Did I catch, capture everything? Yeah, anybody else have to want to add to that? Um, so we were talking about the environmental factors as well. So for example, they might live in like food deserts, which basically means that they don't have access to fresh produce. And because of that, they're forced to eat um, well, less healthy food. And um, I know that sometimes people, like we were talking a little bit about um, like more affluent people not necessarily being as active, but at the same time, you can be low income and be super active. But if you don't have your proper dietary needs met, then you're still going to end up with a lot of health concerns. Over here, um, is it, are they diseases of affluence? What do you think? Yes or no? No. Okay, so. Um, excuse me. We actually did talk about how, like, people who are affluent are just as susceptible as uh, low-income groups of people because um, we argued that it's somewhat plausible that um, affluent people may use the money as sort of a, an excuse to just ignore problems. And I've noticed from personal experience that certain affluent communities will they kind of breed toxicity among themselves and in their in their families and stuff like that. So I think um, the answer is no, because it's not exclusive to them. But I was actually, we were talking about like food deserts and stuff like that too. So they are equally susceptible, not exclusively susceptible. Wow, very important observations. Good, we'll have one more, so I'll just... Uh, our group uh, was uh, talking more about the um, the uh, discrepancies uh, between uh, so like the lower income versus the more affluent and how they have different problems that are both NCDs. For example, uh, in uh, poor communities, there is uh, although they have less uh, to have, they also tend to have to share the resources more and they become more of a community around it rather than in a more wealthy area where they become more isolated uh, and have uh, a more, uh, there's more uh, uh, like loneliness in these areas as well. So, so both of you kind of talked about the importance of your community um, environment on not just social health, but mental health and how that could affect your vulnerability to non-communicable diseases. Is that what everybody's thinking here? All right, so you guys are, you're on top of things. I even ask later, do you know what a food desert is? So we'll talk about that. Okay, good, thanks. <laughs> All right, so Carolyn says, I'd say they are not diseases of affluence since affluent people are able to afford to practice healthy, whoops, wow, we're getting more. Uh, practice more uh, healthy lifestyles while less affluent people cannot. Yeah, and you know, think about green space and and you know places walking, safe walking areas, things like that. Uh, you know, could be definitely influenced by your the, your community. One example of insufficient food could also would also be the stunted growth of children in parts of Latin America because of their diet consists primarily of corn tortillas. 
the lack of proper nutrients contributes to these diseases later in life. Yes, very much. Okay, you guys are all on board. We're going to be talking about that. So uh, this, it's hard to see this, but the darker circle shows the, the most recent data and the lighter circles show the earlier data. So this is almost 20 years of data. And it's looking at the, the leading causes of death in low income countries, which would be Ethiopia would fall in that low middle or middle income, low middle is uh, Nepal, and that's the middle one, and then the USA. Now I've put here what the per capita, so if you took, it, took the, the wealth of the country and you divide it by the number of people in the country, and that assumes that you're distributing the wealth equally, which you know it's not. Um, but the other thing that they do is they go, well, what is that dollar? What can it buy in Ethiopia versus the United States? So they change it to US currency and what it can buy. So the PPP stands for purchasing power parity. So it's saying, you know, what could you buy? So think about what you could live off of if your annual income was $1,903 a year. Um, but the thing here is that we're seeing even in the lowest income countries, um, other than neonatal conditions, which is something you assume in poor countries that the babies are more like likely to die or have complications in childbirth, and then lower respiratory infections, um, pneumonia, those types of things are the leading ones. But right after that, and those are improving since 2000, but right after that comes stroke, or ischemic heart disease and stroke. And in Ethiopia, stroke is a big issue. Um, I have some good friends in, in uh, physical therapy that are constantly working with people that have had strokes. In Nepal, the top two causes of death are ischemic heart disease and stroke. And in the United States, it's ischemic heart diseases and stroke. So it, regardless of income, these diseases are not necessarily finding themselves only amongst people who have enough money to buy too much food and too little to do. It's affecting everyone. And uh, some of you mentioned food deserts, so we'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, also other ways that, that food is exported and lifestyles are exported. So when we talk about the burden of diseases, sure, you know, if you die of them, I mean, we all have to die at some point, so what's the point? Uh, but when we talk about burden, there's a, there's a phrase that's used, it's called daily, D-A-L-Y, and it's disability adjusted life years. So what it does is it takes two things. It says, how many years of life did you die before you should have? So if you die of a heart attack at age 50, and the lifespan in your, in your community is 70, you lost 20 years of life in that. And then the second thing that they calculate into this is how many years of that life that you had before you died were you disabled? So if you had a stroke at 30 and then you died at 50, you had 20 years living with a disability that may have been very severe, and then you died 20 years earlier than you should have. And so that's how they measure. That's one of the ways that they can measure um, burdens. Um, but if you look at these three countries, so I've circled just in case you didn't know where Ethiopia and Nepal are. Um, and compared to the United States, these are the disability adjusted life years from non communicable diseases. And the United States and Nepal look about the same. So it's the same burden in our high income country as it is in the middle, low middle income country. And it's catching up in Ethiopia. Ethiopia still has a pretty high uh, burden of the communicable diseases and maternal neonatal diseases also. Um, but the problem in Ethiopia and Nepal is that they are more likely to have an earlier onset and have poor access to screening so they don't catch it as early and care. Whoops, I'm sorry. I don't know why I keep going backwards on these. So when we're going to get to the global pandemic, uh, but obesity is one of those things. Um, if we're looking at 1975 and 2016, these are global obesity rates around the world. And I've shown you where those countries are, but um, it's increasing in every single country. And um, in Ethiopia and Nepal, it hasn't increased as much because their income, they still have a lot of um, children that are underweight. Um, and some of you mentioned that too. I can't remember, um, somebody mentioned that underweight children, oh, it was in the chat box, um, have a greater propensity for developing obesity and metabolic disorders like diabetes later. 
So we're going to see how those are. So the question is, could obesity be a canary in the mine? If we were watching that, it should be telling us a lot of other things about health and determinants of those health. So the elephant in the room, no pun intended here. Um, it's called lifestyle diseases, but it's time we move away from that because that puts the onus on the behaviors of the person who has the problem with obesity. And it basically shames and belittles a person because they have obesity. 68% um, of Americans, 68, that's, you know, almost three fourths. Um, well, it's two thirds, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of people that are either overweight or obese, and it's increasing exponentially. Um, and it's right now, we're not officially calling it a non communicable disease, but the pathologies and the pathogenesis and the etiologies make it its own clinical problem, and it should be treated as such. It is definitely associated with other non communicable diseases like heart disease and diabetes. But my, in, in Nepal, especially in places like Asia and in Native Americans here in the United States, um, oftentimes they will develop a non uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, without having a, an obesity problem. So there's something metabolically linked that is making them more, more prone to that. They don't have to be obese in order to get um, diabetes. So maybe we need to talk about obesity as a social malnutrition. Think about it. Uh, it's not a very clear slide here, but um, I liked it, and I wanted to just include it. It's from a paper that was done in 2019 um, where it's looking at the classic energy in, energy out. You eat too many calories, you don't do enough exercise. And so it's telling you, basically, it's your fault. You eat too much, you don't do enough. Um, but it's looking at all of the other things that can influence the calories we take in, the exercise we do. It can also influence how our body responds to that. So remember that allostatic load. So some people may be environmentally and culturally surrounded by more healthy environments. And so the energy in, energy out is a little bit more balanced versus others. So on the pink side at the bottom, these are all biological um, uh, determinants or drivers that we, we're learning more about, even things like sleep psychiatric diseases, pain. Um, some, some new things that they're looking at is the gut microbiome. How many of you have heard anything about the gut mi microbiome? So yeah, that's the, um, there's way more cells and, um, and diversity in our gut than there is in our body, but that's very much involved in, in determining our health too. And that can be determined by our, our birth, our mothers, the pregnancy, and our environmental surroundings right when we're, we're born. Then there's epigenetics, um, which can be modifications of our genes so that they express some proteins more or less. And those modifications can be permanent, affected by some exposure as a, as a pre, prenatal baby developing or postnatally. And they can even be passed from, some of them can be passed from mothers to babies. So those phenotypical changes that, that may make you, your body want to put on more fat and eat more food may have been something that was determined by exposure to your mother or even grandmother. So we're learning more about those types of things. So um, just thinking that uh, obesity is more than energy in, energy out. It's complex. It's social. It's economic, food deserts, we'll talk a little bit more about environmental interactions that affect your microbiome or your um, epigenetics. It is associated with cardiometabolic, so cardiovascular disease and metabolic diseases, and it's early in our development, before you're your age. It's starting when you were babies or even before you were born. So this, I, um, I was able to attend virtually because I drove out here yesterday from um, Nebraska, so I didn't hear any of the speakers yesterday, but I was able to uh, attend um, Jonathan Pat's uh, presentation. And this slide right here, I took from the screenshot where he was showing the escalation of the heat, the heat change. And it started well, right around 1950. And the, the one on the other side is showing energy in. So the, the red line is energy in, 
And from 1910 to 1960, um, the intake of energy calories was gradually going down, as was the activity. People had to do less labor, they ate less food, and it paralleled. I'm doing less, I'm eating less, I'm doing less, I'm, but, but weights were maintained until about 1960. Then it just kind of, the intake stabilized there, um, but expenditure kept going down and then intake accelerated up. So both of those things were happening about the same time. Is there an association? Yes, <laughs> yes, there is an association. So I asked about affluence and obesity. Um, these are by states. Uh, you know, a lot of people think of um, Colorado as like the healthiest state. And yes, it has the lowest prevalence of obesity, 15 to 19%. Um, but if you look at the highest prevalences of obesity, that's in the reds, the reds on the left here, uh, they're in the south. And if you look at the highest rates of poverty, they're in the south. And so obesity is not because they have enough money to buy more food or do less work. They're probably working a lot harder than, than the people in Colorado, but they're, they're still getting more obese. So this is where we talk about the food desert. So some of you have already talked about it. So the food desert then is a place where I, the only option I have to buy my groceries is like a convenience store. And I just drove here from Nebraska, so I, I almost thought about taking pictures. But you know what you can get in a convenience store. I was able to get some fresh grapes and a, a sandwich, but you know most of it's packaged and ultra-processed. So ultra-processing of foods takes out most of the nutrient values of the original foods and replaces it with a lot of things that are going to maybe addict your taste buds to it, like more salt, more sugar, more fat. And if you don't think our, our taste buds like those, um, Try saying no to that third Oreo cookie that you just started. It doesn't happen. Um, so that's a food desert. So what is targeted marketing? Does anybody know what targeted marketing is? Okay, so yes, what, do you, what is targeted marketing? Targeted marketing is basically making sure you can market to people you know will buy if you market it in a certain way, such as Super Bowl, um, Bowl ads. We, I'm talking about um, deciding to not talk about, you know, golfing. You know, you, they know the audience is people who are watching the Super Bowl or who are just watching the Super Bowl ads because they don't care about football. Um, totally not me. Uh, but it's basically they market to the people who they know are going to watch. So I'm sending um, ads for kids shows are different going to be than ads for adults. Very good. So it's, it's targeting a certain uh, population. So for like kids, if it's candy or whatever they're selling is sugary, the kids are more likely to ask their parents to buy it. This, this by chance gets the kids more hooked on like the sugars and the candies because they asked the parents to buy it, and that's the shows they're seeing. Yep. And if you ever look at the labels and see how much sugar they put in some of these things, it's probably 10 times the amount it needs to sweeten those things. Um, one last comment, yeah. And sucrose too, which is just normal table sugar, which they put in literally everything that is specifically packaged, is like a natural addictant because it lets off dopamine in your brain, which is the reward hormone, which then makes you just want more and more and more of it and leads to healthy, like unhealthy habits. So that is, that's actually not, what, what you guys were talking about is not targeted marketing as much as it is targeted processing. So that's the ultra processing of the food to make it addictive. Um, Coca-Cola, I'm not, you know, is, is got a lot of sugar in it and and uh, it used to have cocaine in it. That's where it got its name. It had an addiction to, you know, so it would get people addicted to it. Tobacco is hugely addictive. And a few years ago, they decided, you know, we probably shouldn't sell ads for that. But there's ways of getting around the, the uh, legislation. So targeted market, marketing is where you go to a store in some neighborhoods, and they are really pushing these low-cost, highly processed, unhealthy foods in low-income neighborhoods, 
that are also usually food deserts. And you guys are the biggest number of consumers that there are. So a lot of the targeted marketing is targeted towards you because you have a lot of spending power. And uh, so, and it will, it will make you think you're cool too. So it'll, it'll try to, uh, you know, target not just your age group and you should buy this, but it's gonna, you know, if you do buy this product and eat it, you'll be so much cooler than everybody else. So you should do that. So they've figured out how to get you addicted by marketing it to you. All right, so that gets us to this global syndemic. Finally, we're getting to the global syndemic. So a syndemic is a synergistical relationship. And this is paradoxical. And some of you have already uh, made some in the, um, in the uh, chat box. There is an association between a history of undernutrition with a greater risk for obesity and BMI. So in 2019, and that's four years after I started my association with the Ethiopian and Nepal colleagues that I started meeting with, um, a Lancet Commission on Obesity was going to do this, uh, another report and say, where are we now on obesity and what do we need to know about this? Um, but they looked at it and they said, hey, we're missing the point. They said, there's three things going on here that are all interconnected. So they wanted to look at the association and they had the way to an analyze this data, looking at what's going on with the prevalence of undernutrition, a history of undernutrition and malnutrition, and that and, and nutrition risk is, which is the targeted marketing, food deserts, food insecurity, those types of things. Um, and then also they looked at the climate change because the business of the food industry is very dependent on the environment and agriculture. So they looked at all of these things. So climate change is compounding food insecurity. And where do you think, one of the things when I was listening to Jonathan's talk the other day was that, you know, we were looking at the impact on, on the United States, but the big carbon producers emissions are the, are the, the high income countries. The United States is the biggest. And then we've got the Europeans and some, you know, China, Russia. But who are going to be the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change that does not know national borders? those countries that are, the, that are already not very secure. So um, climate change, food insecurity, et cetera. Uh, this is demanding that we have a more holistic perspective to understand and to address. So looking at the different um, non-communicable disease dailies, I don't know how well, yeah, you can see this pretty well. Okay, so it shows you global. Let's look at the top line first. The blue line, the darkest blue is saying, um, what's the uh, percentage of people that are having, have a high BMI, so overweight, obese? Then the second one is the dietary risks. Those that are eating ultra, too much ultra processed and have food insecurity or live in the food desert areas. And then the last one is child undernutrition. So it's looking at the global levels there. Then it looks at other related non-communicable diseases, including systolic blood pressure, tobacco, um, high fasting plasma glucose, which is diabetes. Um, I think that's, is it? yeah, oh, water and sanitation is one of them also in Ethiopia. So if we compare them, it doesn't surprise us that the United States has a high, the highest obesity, high BMI, but look at Nepal, it's very close. And not only that, but look at the systolic blood pressure and the plasma fasting glucose in Nepal. So diabetes and high blood pressure is just as extensive in Nepal as it is in the United States. And it's almost as extensive in Ethiopia as it is in, in the United States. So it's not about income. Um, those early um, exposures are important. And in many of these countries, we're seeing um, increased urbanization, especially because of climate change. They cannot survive in the rural co economy, so they move into the cities and there's no place for them to live. They live in slums, they eat whatever they can, and they're now exposed to their Western lifestyles where they can get you know, fast foods and ultra processed foods, which are the cheapest ones and they're targeted. Uh, it's targeted marketing there too. So oh, what was that? I didn't want to do that. What's that? <laughs> okay. There we go. All right, so not all of you are gonna go into health, right? How many of you are going to go into, are thinking about a health profession? Okay, so a lot of you. How many of you are not thinking about a health profession? Yeah, most of you. Okay, 
So what I want you to look, take home from this is this is from that Lancet article. And I want you to look at the synergistic drivers of this pandemic, this uh, syn synergistic pandemic. Um, we've got natural systems, eco economics, transport, urban design, land use, hospitals, schools, workplaces, social circles, communities, everything is interconnected. And they push each other. So the, the second one that's on this side, um, it, it, it is circling. So when one is pushing, it pushes the other one, which pushes another one. So it has a progressive effect. And synergistically means that it's going to be escalating. So it's not just additive. We're not just adding another degree. We're adding two degrees for every one thing. So that's what we're seeing with that it, um, exponential increase. So I'm going to give this. I've never done this with a group before, but I thought I would give it a try. Um, the top is a link here, but you can use a QR code if you take your phones out. How often do you get to told to take your phones out? And I'm going to have you screen this. This is going to take you to the website for the Landsat. And, I want, and I'm going to open it up also, but I want you to take a look at it and then talk amongst yourselves. Okay, so first, did everybody, did, were you able to get it? Everybody good? All right. Okay, okay so now I'm going to... Okay, so on this website, if you scroll down here, we're going to take a look at this movie, um, but click on, look at this area right here, which is ways that you can improve your promoting active transport modes could improve food security. So look at those. You can look at them slower if you want to. But obesity, undernutrition, and, and climate change have shared drivers, and they're going to have shared solutions. Okay, so just take a look at that, and then um, I'll have you stand up and talk with each other, and I'll get back to my slides. I'm going to have you stand up and thinking about the website, you can still look at it if you need to, but who do you think will be more vulnerable to the global syndemic consequences, Nepal, Ethiopia, or the USA? And then the second one is, what are some examples of actions that might impact both climate change and obesity? So go ahead and stand up. <laughs> I don't let you sit very long. <laughs>
All right. I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking we'll just have somebody shout out. So uh, who do you think is going to be more um, vulnerable to global syndemic consequences? Nepal, Ethiopia, USA. How many say USA? How many say Nepal and Ethiopia? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it will be Nepal and Ethiopia. You know, we've got to think about how it will impact us. Yes. But um, our production is impacting others who have nothing to do with the production. And we need to be thinking about them also. So that brings us to ho hopefully some solutions. I want you to think about this. Uh, developmental plasticity is the ability to bounce back. So, you know, I hurt my knees playing volleyball in college. They're really bad. When I was in college, they said, you have 60 year old, year old knees. That was when I was in college. They said, you're going to be a great knee replacement. I haven't had them yet. I'm looking at maybe next summer. But they don't bounce back um, like they used to. Um, so plasticity is the ability to be injured or harm your, you know, be harmed by whatever exposures you have. But then your body heals. Uh, with the, if they have to do surgery on a baby in, in utero, they, they come out with no scars. Um, so, you know, you don't even form scars when you've got a lot of plasticity. But our ability to bounce back starts getting less and less as we get older. And you are at the peak of your plasticity age. When you get into your 20s and 30s, you're going to start going downhill on that. So the slide over here is showing um, our plasticity on the back. So that's the green line on the bottom here. And it's showing how it declines with age. And then on the right, on the, on the x-axis, that the vertical axis there, it's saying, well, what did you inherit and what do, were you exposed to that's going to increase your risk for poor health throughout your life? And it happens in your up to about 20 years old. So you're right in that area. And at that age, the damage to your, your health is not noticeable. It hasn't moved at all. But look how it escalates as you get older and older. So the problem with non-communicable diseases is that they develop from the time you're kids and they don't present until you're 30, 40, or 50 years old. So it's really easy to just push it off and say, it's not my problem because I feel fine. Uh, so that's one of the problems there. So plasticity is important and um, adolescents have a potential that's more than just biological. And that's uh, what I'm, I want to share with this heart's uh, program that we've been doing. So yeah, I just have to share. Um, these pictures are from Nepal and Ethiopia. Uh, what we did is uh, we went and we taught them how to do blood pressures and screening. So we'll talk a little bit about those as we go through here. So the Hearts Initiative, it really started in 2015 when I first met my colleagues in Nepal. Um, and we did a final workshop in 2019. And as you all know, Right after that, we had COVID come. So it's put a, a halt on a, a lot of things that everybody was doing. The problem with um, health and global health in particular is that in developing countries, they are still plagued by the communicable diseases. And I have a mosquito here because of malaria as the obvious one. Uh, but the assumption is, is that people in the low middle income countries, that's what LMIC stands for, um, they uh, don't live long enough to get heart disease or diabetes. They die of uh, infectious diseases or something um, early in life. But the paradox is, is that when you look at their lifespan, it's lower because they still do have a high infant child mortality. That brings the average down. But if they survive those first five years, many of them will live to be 80, 90 years old if they're healthy enough. They will acquire those diseases and they do acquire those diseases. So to think that it doesn't happen is wrong. In Nepal, 70% of all deaths are uh, non-communicable diseases and 77% of the dailies, disability adjusted life years. The cost globally of non-communicable diseases is predicted to be $47 trillion by 2030. And as we're talking about the impact, when we have sick people that may have a stroke and can no longer support and work for their family, that's going to inf impact develop economic development in those countries also. Problem number two that we were just mentioning, um, NCDs are silent until they present as a stroke or something like that. And so we always have, you know, it's easy to put them off and ignore them and not do anything about them until it's too late, actually. So 
there's a lot of social and public complacency about non-communicable diseases versus the tyranny of the urgent that we just experienced with COVID and the whole world came up in arms because of an infectious disease. I'm not saying that's wrong, um, but we all tend to pay attention to things that are urgently happening and we tend to push off for another day things that are not that urgent. And this creates um, a um, policy inertia, especially with the food industry because their, their economics depend on it. So um, these are important that to, to think about. The other thing about this, it's a problem in no, low middle income countries is that the treatment and management of a chronic disease, once you uh, get it, whether it be diabetes or hypertension, for example, you have to take a medication pretty much the rest of your life. And that's not something that most people wanna do. And most of us wanna take a drug, get cured and be done with this. We don't wanna do this. So, so being compliant, even in a, well, uh, a, a high income country, a lot of people don't want to take the drugs all the time because it, it causes them the other side effects they don't like. So compliance and the need to treat forever is something that's, that's not something we want to have to deal with. The last one, and these are pictures from Nepal and Ethiopia. Here we were setting up an, uh, an eye and ear, nose, uh, throat surgical camp in a remote area. It was about eight hour drive on really bad roads in, into a beautiful area, Ramashap in Nepal. But they were putting these uh, hospitals, they were setting up a hospital room in a school that had no screens on the windows. We had to just put tarps over the windows and you know brush the, the flies away. Uh, when the power went out, I used my phone so that they had their they could have a light to finish the surgery. Uh, you know, so it was just it's it's that's that's the access to this. The number of uh, care uh, care professionals and hospitals is uh, not enough. Uh, this gentleman was brought by his grandson. I'm not sure how far he carried him in the basket. He had his, his spine was crushed over probably as complications from tuberculosis at some point in his life. And so he couldn't stand up. So his, his son, his grandson brought him, I don't know how many miles to get his eyes. He had cataracts in both eyes and uh, they did the surgery in that. The other one, this is in Ethiopia. This is at the teaching hospital at Bahadar University. That's the medical records room. <laughs> I just love that sign. Good luck. <laughs> I, I mean, it's it's sad, but it's that that's exactly how it is. And this was a, a teaching hospital. They um, were they had some sick patients, so they had students there, family members there. Um, you know, it's just the access to medical care is not very good, and the screening capacity. Oops, gosh, why does it keep going back? So the so Hearts Initiative was at the Nepal Hospital and their eye, ears, nose, throat rehabilitation services. They recognized we don't have enough healthcare providers to do just basic things like vision screening so we can catch kids in second grade that need glasses and get them glasses. So they said, let's teach the kids to do it. So they taught students how to do vision screening and then they validated it and they saw that the students were just as good at um, correctly screening for vision impairments as a professional, as an optometrist. optometrist. And so they, they published that. And that's what I said, well, if they can teach them how to do this, we can teach them how to do blood pressures and BMIs. So that's where the, the um, Hearts Initiative came from. Here's a young man who's doing vision screening out in Ramashop. So the Lancet also had a commission on adolescent health and well-being. We always seem to think that you're the target of interventions, yes. Yeah, save that, please save that for like the end questions because that's body image, that, that goes with the shaming and the blaming and also our you know, society. Um, that's, those are really important questions. Um, yeah, good question. Anyway, um, the, the Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing said that adolescents and young people are our best chance to achieve radical change for a prosperous, healthy and sustainable world. Not because if we make you healthier, then you will be a healthier population for the next generation because you know how that goes. Anybody telling me what I'm gonna eat and what I'm gonna do, I, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of rebellious and I think adolescents are kind of like the same thing. It's like, no, I'll do what I want. The whole point of what they're doing is they're saying, hey, we can't do it alone and you guys are talented and capable. So what we need is to partner on finding out what we can do and figuring out how to do this. So because of your ability, energy, 
um, it, they were able to train a lot of high school students in remote and, and um, uh, urban areas to do vision screening in their schools and get those kids glasses before they were too late and also hearing um, screening. Um, they are also leaders in their schools then and advocates and they can found healthy lifestyles. So we did the same thing for hypertension and obesity. HEART stands for Hypertension Education and Resourcing Talented Students. And this is a logo that college students at Wayne State College designed. Um, it, it has a heart on there, has a bicycle. You know, I like bicycles. And then each of the countries in their own language. Um, so each of the students got a T-shirt. They went to two-day training to learn how to do blood pressure, learn the basics of non-communicable diseases, how to, to calculate BMI. And between 2017 and 2019, the HEARTS teams in Nepal, we started it there because they already had the model in, in place for the vision screening. They, have, they had screened by 2019 over 1,000 students. And they discovered that of those students, 130 of them already had elevated blood pressure. So they found it early and surprisingly. We don't think of high school students as having high blood pressure. Then they get, that's not a diagnosis, that's just a screening. And then they send them to a healthcare professional to see if they do need treatment. They also provided community family screening days. And um, later on at the, in 2019, we had a workshop and we did a you know, kind of a group study and asked them, you know, what did you gain from this? But we found out that their health literacy was much greater. They knew and understood what non-communicable diseases were, what the consequences were of their lifestyle choices and what other things they had to do and, and what, what a problem it was for public health. Um, they had gained confidence. And they were really eager to continue this. They felt like they were empowered to be responsible and contribute to the health of their schools and communities. So here's some pictures of some of the students. Um, I, uh, I went back and I tested them on their accuracy of taking blood pressure. Um, a lot of them, how many of you know how to take a blood pressure or have learned how to take a blood pressure? So, okay, quite a few, that's good. Um, you know, you listen to the, the sounds of the blood coming through after you, you've occluded the blood vessels, and then you listen to it coming through. Um, and the first sounds are the systolic blood pressure, and then when they mute out, then that's the diastolic blood pressure. Um, they didn't all have uh, stethoscopes, so they were using the radial pulse. So they felt the pulse, and when it disappeared, they knew the, the cuff had been inflated enough, and then they just kept feeling the pulse, and then when they felt a pulse again, they marked that down as systolic. Now, you can't do diastolic that way, but you can do systolic, and systolic happens to be the more important of the two pressures. So I thought, wow, I wonder how good they are at this. So I used my stethoscope while they were doing the radial pulse uh, feeling, and they, um, we, they were spot on. These kids were doing an awesome job. So their skills were amazing. Uh, they just, they can do anything. So just more pictures of those students. So we took the model to Ethiopia, and they got it off the ground and had all of their students trained, uh, trained by December of 2019, and then COVID hit after, after that. So they weren't able to do any community screening. So we don't know, you know, have, haven't been able to do anything there. But again, they did 75 students. They're wearing the T-shirts for the Hearts Initiative, and um, they're ready to go when um, school and uh, COVID allows them to do that. So these kids are educated, equipped, empowered, and we're talking about summits now. And this I got from the WAS seminar. Uh, we would love to connect the Ethiopian students with the Nepal students, and someday with groups of American students um, in communities virtually so that they can share best practices and you know, kind of share what's going on in their communities, what they're learning, ideas that, uh, that they've had to kind of build a cadre of international students that are connected, that are working on the HEARTS initiative. So, so take home points, and I'm going to call it, and then I'm going to let you ask a bunch of questions. The global syndemic has multiple biological, social, and environmental drivers, and they're all connected. And as one is moving one, one the other way, they're interactive. Um, Non-communicable disease pathogenesis begins at the beginning, maybe even prenatally. Um, but certainly the habits that we adopt, we usually adopt them by the time we're, the way we're going to eat, drink, and whatever else, we draw, adopt them in our adolescent to young adult ages. Plasticity is the ability to bounce back, and uh, it declines after adolescence. Adolescence is a critical window of opportunity and potential, not only for 
addressing behavior that's going to be healthy for life, but also empowering you to be the change makers for this health in your families and communities. Um, the Hearts Initiative is designed to get it started and then let you guys go with that. Um, it is multidisciplinary. It takes a multidisciplinary approach, and it's also multi-generational. If it's just old people telling young people what to do because we're smarter, we've been here long, let me just tell you, I'm not smarter. I'm hoping to hear some great ideas from you guys. Um, so we need to reimagine global health and wellness. So what I want you to be doing is thinking, what other benefits can you think about mental health, social health, and well-being does Hearts Initiative have the potential for? So if given the opportunity, adolescents and young adults can change the world. So this is summits coming into view. So dream of the summits, but build relationships because not everybody gets to the summit. So make sure you make good friends along the way of people that you love. And I'm just going to share some more pictures. Uh, this is, um, I finally got to see the Himalaya. It, they're not always visible from the Kathmandu Valley. Um, but I saw a brilliance in the, in the students that I was working with that far exceeds the, the Himalaya. The other picture is in Bahadar. Um, these are some of my friends and relationships in Ethiopia. They're family to me. And um, my friends in uh, Nepal. And these, uh, those are the, the WAS students that hosted us the first year. So um, it's all about relationships. So I'm a Suganalo. Danyavad. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to everybody. <laughs> All right. Questions are contagious ideas. So shall we have the question you had on body imaging? Yeah. Um, I actually have two questions. So sorry. Um, so my first one was about how can we also like, because BMI is something like the calculation of that is something that is important, but also can be harmful and become obsessive. Like, how can we combat that as well as try to promote healthy lifestyles? That's a really good question. BMI is basically a quick and easy way to screen a bunch of people um, by using their height and weight ratios. Okay but it's not the best way for all people. Um, some people may have denser bones and muscles, so their weight on the scale looks big, but they're, they're not overly fat. Um, waist, waist to hip measurements are good ones because abdominal obesity is more risky for health than, than other ones. So I think the important thing is to, to say, let's use multiple ones. We need to screen for public health. So that's, you know, we have one problem over here. How do we track where we are and what we know? And how do we keep that tracking from shaming and obsessing people about their BMI? And I don't have an easy answer for that. Um, I think there's a lot. Uh, if you look at, if you even look historically at, at um, models and things, before the 50s and 60s, uh, women especially were very curvy. And, uh, and then Twiggy came in like 1965, right about the time when obesity was going up. And she had no shape at all. Uh, she was a model that had just no shape at all. In other countries, um, you know, a very thin person, a woman might be, and it's usually more with women than men, um, but they might be seen as unhealthy, un unreliable. I can't, yeah, I don't know if you're going to survive. I need somebody with a little bit more weight. So there's, there's a lot of stigmas on weight everywhere, but we need to talk about how to get over the stigmas and I think moving our understanding to that our weight is not just my choice. It's affected by so many other things. Yeah, good question. Greg, I'm sorry. Did you want to ask? I'm, I'm running around with the, the mic. Do you want a question? Yeah. Um, yeah, how much, how much time do we have? Okay. 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 So if you want to ask a question, we do ask um, that you uh, make it one question per person, please. And uh, you can come up to, uh, you can line up at the microphones 
and uh, one question per person. And uh, virtual delegates, if you want to ask a question, Aaron will be watching um, Zoom. Uh, so you can simply raise your hand or put it in the chat. So uh, thank you. So one question per person. Thank you. All right. Hi, my name is Annika and I'm from Nina. You talked about healthy and unhealthy behaviors that influence obesity and NCDs. How do you, and how you guys have enabled kids to help communities, but how do we create a more positive social environment in low income countries where they might not have the resources to balance the healthy lifestyle, where they intake um, an equal amount of equal an equal amount of healthy behaviors, or have your programs been able to contribute to healthier behavioral traits? Ah, that's a good question. Um, actually, the first step in that question is cultural humility, is not thinking that their, their behaviors are unhealthy and ours are healthy, or I know the healthy ones and you don't know the healthy ones. Um, I'll use an example with Bahadar, because uh, Dr. Potts um, was in Bahadar to promote bicycling. Bahadar is on Lake Tana. It is a beautiful community. It could be a tourist resort area. And you can bicycle everywhere there. But there is now this sense that if you bicycle, it's because you're too poor to own a car. And so there's that, that sense that we have to be modern or Western looking. And so we've lost that cultural humility that their lifestyles were always healthy, much healthier, and maybe we should be learning from them. So I think uh, every place is, is different. So I, I think trying to come up with a one-way so, one solution for any place is wrong. We need to go there first and listen, learn, find out what their, what their strengths and their capacities and their assets are, and say, okay, let's build on those. And let's not change you to look like us. Yeah, good question. Hi, um, I was really interested on that research on like, adolescent plasticity and I was wondering if you had anything to say about like when is it too late like what how does reversal appear in like middle age older age and do you have any anything to say about like how to really combat that and like reassuring people it's not too late mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question I you know I, I haven't read you know what developmentally uh, if, if you look at our, our genes, we start, you know, every time our cells divide, we break off a little bit of the telomeres, and that seems to be associated with aging. That may be associated with plasticity, and I'm not sure about that. But what I'm wondering, back to her, you know, to think, what could we do to delay the decline? Well, hang out with young people, I think is a good way to do it. <laughs> But um, I think, you know, the healthier lifestyles we have, the, the better chance we are to maintain our, our plasticity longer from the beginning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Very good question. Somebody needs to do some research on that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jeffrey. I'm from Connecticut. Um, and I thought that the stories of the kids in the countries doing the medical work was very inspiring and cool. Um, but I was wondering what the experience was like for them. Was it more of a chore or do you think that they enjoyed it and potentially would become doctors in countries that need doctors? Yeah, um, for the, they universally enjoyed it. Some of them want to become doctors, but, um, but some of them are not gonna go into medicine, but they just felt like I'm doing something important and I'm making a difference. And um, the feed, that's why we're pursuing it. We're continuing to pursue it because they're the ones that are saying, we want to do more of this. So we want, I'm looking to you guys saying, could we do it here? What would we change to do it here? And how do we, you know, scale it up so that more, more adolescents are doing it? Great, Great that's question. So cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Karishma. Um, I live in Brookfield, Wisconsin. And I know you were talking about like why it's important that we don't um, build dependency with other countries and why it's important to have this mutually beneficial exchange. So um, what are some key things that um, we can do just in like programs at large to ensure that they're institutionally sustainable? Yeah, that's a whole course. That's a whole life study. But um, I think it's important that we all understand our history, global history, and the impact of colonization post-colonization and neo-colonial thinking, um, 
you know, it, it gets a bad rap and everybody goes, oh, you're one of those. But we really have to think about the impact of um, capitalistic gains made from developing countries that created a perpetual dependency on the higher income countries. The capacity for them to develop themselves is phenomenal, but they're being held back by global um, markets, global forces, and things like that, yeah. But it really does require, a, a cultural humility, I think, is the most important thing. If you, we can adopt every, anything is, is to learn to listen and get to know people from around the world and realize that we don't have all the answers. Um, yeah, there's a great book. It's called Listen, Think, Act. And it's by Agnes Egoya, I-G-O-U-Y-E, Jamie Van Leeuwen. And, and I, if, you, just, if you do the first one, you'll get it all. Um, but they do um, global development and community development. She's from Uganda. He's from Denver, Does you know works with homeless people in Denver, and she works with trafficking, human trafficking in, in Uganda. And uh, it's just so basic and perfect. <laughs> Listen, think, act. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Veronica, and I am a Congolese refugee now living in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say, as a refugee, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. It uh, sounds very genuine, and I really just appreciate how you're putting so much effort in it. Mm -hmm. uh, my question was, uh, you touched a little, uh, you touched based on a little bit about how some developed countries go into developing countries with, like, they kind of help, but it's just like for short term help. Uh, so what do you think is the best way for developed countries to go into developing countries and help them expand their HDI? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for the kind words. And uh, th that book that I just mentioned, I think would be a great place to start. Listen, Think, Act, because these are um, people that have worked with um, international um, organizations, non-governmental organizations and international organizations uh, that is trying to change that perspective of, you know, we're going to come in and help you. That's where we need to get away from it because we need to say, all right, what do you want to do? What are your resources? What are your capacities? What do you want to do? How can we get out of the way and, and facilitate your development of your own capacities? I think listening is the first thing and cultural humility. Um, and there's probably going to have to be some, because there's profit involved, you know, as, lo as long as there's money involved, um, there's always going to be those markets that are going to capitalize wherever they can. So we've got to have some protections, I think. Um, yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Um, my name is Peyton and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I would just like to ask you with like everything that you discussed is so interconnected, like nutrition, obesity, and climate change. Um, how do we go about solving and educating on these different broad topics, especially with the huge role that society plays in our lives and perception? Okay. Um, yeah, that's my passion. I mean, and that, those are the questions. There's no easy answers on that. But I'm going to just share. Um, we're working on a major, developing a major at my college called One Health. So it basically, uh, a student would get um, agricultural environmental science, human health sciences, social and humanities, social sciences as basic foundation. And then they could, you know, then focus on, well, do I want to go into policy or do I want to go into agricultural, you know, or do I want to go into health, allied health professions? Now, that's, it sounds all really good, but I want to just um, give credit where credit is due. This is not a new idea. The indigenous people all around the world have always had this one health philosophy. We're all related. We're, you know, the, the animals, the earth, the people, if they're unhealthy, we're unhealthy. And they understood that. Um, so we really need to learn from that traditional knowledge and then use our advanced technical knowledge to weave a better uh, application of our knowledge and, and learn from traditional knowledges that really had it right in the first place. Thank you so much. Yeah, That's amazing. thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, my question, oh, I'm Jack Alden. I am from Coralville, Iowa. Uh, my question is, 
would GMOs be a good way to help with food deserts and food insecurity since they can you be made to grow in more places with less water or grow bigger yields with less food? Or would it be an issue with transportation then? That would be a good question for Dr. Patz. <laughs> it's not my area. So I, I really don't know. But I think, um, you know, what he talked about is we need to, and I have family members who are beef and pork producers. I mean, I'm in Nebraska. That's what they do. Um, so when we say, hey, people need to eat less of that and more of, you know, grain type foods, because it's, it's more environmentally sustainable. I don't know about GMOs and I don't know how, you know, I, I haven't done the research on that, but I think one thing that I heard him say that I thought is really important, he needs, we need to have a way of transitioning because we can't just say, we're gonna take away your livelihood now because it's not right. That puts a lot of people, you know, they're not gonna like that idea at all. So we have to figure out how do we move that transition from a, a total dependence on one type of agricultural um, economics to a more sustainable economic without harming all of the people involved. It's not an easy question. That reminds you of one time hearing about how some people went and taught coding to coal miners or something. Yes. Yeah. He said that. Yeah. Yeah. He was talking about a transition. That's I think he used coal miners as the example. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. I love you. your outfit, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to see if there is. I'm going to see if there's any chat questions. Yeah, we have Dr. Dr. E, just yes. so you know, we do need to um, lunch. Lunch is happening actually as we speak. So, oh, sorry. Uh, 